Father, we came to thy presence with the confidence that you have given to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, that you have accepted us. Lord, this moment we remember our brethren who have been sick and uh, are recovering now, Lord, especially uh, Nelson, and who is in tremendous pain, Lord. I pray that your hand may be upon him, strengthen him, Lord. Help him to recover soon and uh, help him so that he may be able to cope and uh, overcome the pain. I pray that your strength may be granted to Linda also. We remember Surya Murthy, sir. Touch him and heal him, Lord, and uh, so that he may be able to continue a normal life. Lord, we remember all our brethren who are spread all over the country. Yeah. And we also remember Christine, uh, Amir's wife, mm. as she is also struggling with the various uh, health-related issues, Lord. I pray you touch her and heal her. We remember our uh, brethren who are in uh, who are going through uh, health issues, Lord. I pray your grace may be upon them and you heal them completely. At the time we are going to spend in your presence meditating your word, maybe a time that edifies us and be fruitful in our life, Lord. The discussions we do and the uh, Meditations we make, Lord, may be acceptable in your sight. And we would like to ask you to speak to us through your servant and grant us the spirit and your grace so that we may be able to perceive and receive uh, what you wanted to communicate to us, Lord. Thank you very much for listening to us. We submit this time to the throne of grace and asking for your mercies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh... Praveen for leading us. Uh, as I had posted on the WhatsApp uh, group, I decided that we will take up these, uh, you know, uh, the subject of co uh, creation controversy uh, and maybe spend two or either three studies in this. Uh, I don't think I can sustain it for too, for too long because um, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> so I don't have the credentials to really comment on the science that uh, people talk about trying to discredit the Bible. So uh, uh, I just want to be more theologically focused and try to bring uh, the Bible into uh, uh, the light that we want to see it in. So. Uh, so we might spend, like I said, two or three studies in this. Uh, and I want to start, start off by talking about perhaps a more basic issue. And that is, uh, as I mentioned in the message, uh, create the, the, the objection people make with regards to the creation account is that the creation in Genesis is not a scientific account and hence, uh, there is a temptation to say that the Bible is, well, uh, wrong. Uh, the Bible is not credible. Uh, it cannot be, you know, taken for the truth. A question that uh, somebody asked, you know, goes like this. I am confused. I am not a theologian and I am not a scientist. But I know what the Bible says about how life began. And I also know basically how the theory of evolution explains it. They can't both be right, can they? So who do I believe, God or the scientists? Uh, now, of course, this uh, question uh, brings in the theory of evolution, which we might touch upon a little later. I mean, not today, but maybe in another study. Um, but today's topic and discussion will be centered around is Bible and science against each other? And that is what, uh, where the debate starts. Uh, people like to say that the Bible uh, is not scientific. Uh, of course, the age old debate with regards to religion and science are not compatible. 
there are many who insist that our theological system is always at war with modern science, right? Um, so the controversy rages on and uh, sci scientists say that biblical theology is myth or mythology. They are just stories. Uh, and some of them say they are borrowed from other texts. Uh, but on the other hand, theologians say that science does not really give us any truth, which is again an exaggeration. Science does have something to offer, but then theologians take it to the other extreme. And so uh, this is how the controversy still remains. And of course, the debate goes on. But where did it all begin? Uh, where did the con where, where, what was the beginning of the controversy? And I, I'm sure many of you will know that in the 16th and the 17th century, when science was beginning to evidence-based science was beginning to uh, you know come onto the public domain, uh, the church began to be very fearful, specifically the Catholic Church, because they feared heretics spreading teachings and opinions that in their view contradicted the Bible. Uh, in fact, the Catholic Church went to the extent of persecuting scientists uh, who formed certain theories that the church deemed heretical, all right? And they tried to ban books, uh, forbid, forbid people from reading, you know, those books that promoted a scientific view, especially of uh, the universe of cosmology. So that is where a type of war began between science and religion. And of course it plays on even today. The names Nicholas Co uh, Copernicus and Galileo Galilei, I'm sure is familiar to you, uh, especially Galileo. Um, Copernicus, preceded Galileo, and he was the one who started this controversy on uh, the earth is not the center uh, of the universe in the sense that uh, the, uh, the, the sun does not go around the earth. That is where he, through his observations, uh, began to teach that the earth goes around the sun. And that became a heretical teaching for the church because, you know, when you look up into the sky, uh, do you see the earth going around? Uh, you, you normally see the sun going from one end to the other end, right? From the east to the west. And so the obvious conclu conclusion is, it is the sun that is moving. But Copernicus had the guts to say, no, the sun is not moving. It is the earth that is moving. Right? And then, of course, uh, uh, Copernicus didn't uh, live too long after his, he wrote his book. So he was not necessarily targeted as much as Galileo, who came for after <laughs> Copernicus. And uh, Galileo proposed the same. He said that the sun, uh, the earth moves around the sun. Uh, and of course, he was even tried at the Inquisition. Uh, after his book was published, he was, uh, I think, forced to recant. Uh, he was told that he, he would be, you know, punished if he wouldn't. And I, uh, I didn't follow the story, but uh, I'm presuming that he publicly recanted, but privately still believed in uh, what, you know, his theory was, scientific theory was. So, um, so the church obviously disapproved uh, of this theory because according to them, the Holy Scripture state that the earth is at the center, not the sun, all right? So how do we, how do we look at this, you know? Uh, how do we read the Bible? Uh, do we read it as a uh, science book or a science textbook? And that is where I think, uh, we come to a more theological conclusion uh, to understand there are certain things that the Bible was not meant to tell us. Uh, the Bible has a purpose. Uh, the reason God recorded what is written in the Bible has a specific purpose. And 
uh, the as much as we understand, the purpose was not to tell us the how of creation or uh, you know whether Genesis is a scientific what do you call it a record of the creation. So these are the the, the problems. So the first point I want to make was um, uh, that the Bible is not a science book. It should not be read like a science textbook. And the conflict, you know, between Bible and science was unfortunately borne out by misguided Christians uh, who wanted to sort of bring in science and force science into the book. And that I think is unfortunate and uh, misguided, like, uh, like, you know, like an article says. Some people would like to say, you know, the Bible contains all the truth. Uh, and so what is the conclusion? Well, the Bible is sufficient for me. I don't need science to tell me what is, you know, true through an observation. Uh, I only need the Bible. And that, I think, uh, becomes unfortunate because the Bible was never meant to be worshipped. Right? Uh, the book was never, never meant to be worshipped. Uh, the God did not intend for the Bible to be worshipped in that, in that respect. Now, Bible contains truth, but it does not necessarily give us truth that can be observed through nature, which we call natural theology. We can observe certain things and we can you know, come to a conclusion, what is true and what is not true. Uh, and you don't necessarily need the Bible for that, but the Bible is necessary for certain uh, very important truths. And that is what we need to recognize and understand. Okay. Um, David, o, uh, David E. O'Brien, uh, he wrote a book called Today's Handbook for Solving Bible Difficulties. Uh, he clearly states that God did not choose to include scientific knowledge in the scriptures. Now, that doesn't mean to say you cannot find some scientific references, but the basic overall intention of the Bible being recorded was not necessarily to, for it to contain scientific information. He says, and I quote uh, uh, from his, uh, the, the, the handbook, if he, that is God, had chosen to inspire a scientific treat treatise, I have no doubts that he would have given us one that uh, battalions of Einsteins would need millennia to unravel. He carefully chose not to burden his revelation with scientific language that would rapidly find itself outdated. Uh, so that is a very important observation to make. You know, if God decided to put scientific information, you know, at that time when the development of science hadn't yet taken place, people would have uh, found it very difficult to to read the book. So. Uh, so we can conclude that God did not intend for, you know, giving a scientific record of, let's say, the creation or any other thing for that matter. So the question now is, how is the creation account written in Genesis? So I'm going to specifically go to the creation account, right? Because we are talking about creation controversies. How is the creation account written in the, in the book of Genesis? And we can say, uh, for lack of better words, it's a timeless, it's a timeless, non-scientific explanation of the existence of the creation. Right? It can be read at any time in history, and people can still understand its basic intent. Right? And what is the basic intent? God intended who and why the creation came to be, to be, not the how, right? God did not intend to tell us how the creation in its scientific, with all its scientific details came to be, even though there are certain uh, 
you know, literal uh, statements in the book, in the creation account that tells us when something came and all of those things. But I think from our, uh, you know, analysis, it is the who and the why, which is more important. Who created and for what reason, why? That is, I think, the, uh, what we need to keep in mind when we read the creation account. And so if you start looking at it scientifically, then you will be uh, reading amiss and you'll be reading a lot of controversies. Uh, in fact, if you look at the creation account itself, you can quickly, from a scientific perspective, find many things that does not match. I mean, uh, for example, God said, let there be light. That was the first day. But he created the sun on the fourth day. So, I mean, it all seems like that. So, uh, logic, I mean, to say uh, chronologically, there is a problem. But if you look at it logically, there isn't a problem. God was not necessarily trying to uh, prove, you know, with a, with a with, you know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, the chronology of the, of the creation. So, we, th these are thoughts that, you know, will be very helpful for us to. Keep in mind when we read, uh, you know, the creation account, especially. So, um, uh, so how is the creation account recorded in the in the book of Genesis, or why is it done? It is so that God would could tell us where we came from, that there was a beginning. Is it inter interesting? It starts off by saying, "In the beginning." Science, scientists are now beginning to acknowledge that the, the universe had a beginning. There are some scientists who still don't accept that. They say the creation is time, not creation, but the universe is timeless. Uh, it always existed. But now, through all the scientific evidence we have, we know that there has been a beginning and the Bible declares that <laughs> right? right at the outset. And uh, the Bible tells us where we came from. Where did you come from? <laughs> from nowhere. <laughs> from nothing. God created the universe from nothing. But he created it out of his love. That the creation came out of love, you could say. But there was no pre-existent material from which you know, the creation came to be, right? Uh, so all of this is telling us why he created us and it's beginning to show us the very purpose for creation. The creation account tells us what is our place in the order of creation, right? Where do we, where, where are we in the uh, food chain? <laughs> if I can just use that uh, uh, rather facetiously. Uh, you know, a lot of scientists believe we are just mere animals, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, more advanced animals. But uh, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says we are a special creation with created with the image of God in us. Uh, so we, God specifically created us after all of the other creation because he had a specific purpose in mind for us. Um, and of course, from there, it goes on, Genesis account goes on to talk about the human experience and why we have the pain and the suffering and the misery that we see today. We know uh, it goes on to talk about the fall. And actually, uh, you know, that itself is a, is a, is a very, uh, what do you say, uh, eloquent argument as to the existential reality that we can explain today. Lots of people are unable to explain the existential reality of suffering and pain and difficulty. Uh, some people say it's, uh, uh, you know, there is no meaning to it. There is no purpose to it. You are just there. You are just a force of accident. You, you accidentally came to be. And so, uh, but I think the Bible explains that quite eloquently. Now, I must say that the way it is written, uh, we have to be careful that we don't try to, you know, match the chronology uh, there is a, you could say, a poetic style in which it is written. 
uh, or perhaps more uh, uh, what uh, more uh, what you say clearly we could say it is written in a way not to explain a scientific method it is not explaining a scientific method it is only uh, giving a you could say somebody uses these words exalted prose narrative <laughs> uh it could it could we say it's a poetic style it's more than a poetic style it's also a narrative it's also historic right it's also literal there was a literal creation so uh, the book of genesis brings and brings all of these uh styles of writing i think the technical word for that is genre the genre of the book of uh, of genesis has a blend of the of po the poetic the narrative the historic and the literal and so it's a somebody says an exalted prose narrative so what is uh, the creation account telling us it tells us the timeless truth of creation uh the revelation had to be something you know for for it to be a timeless truth of creation it uh, it had to be something more than just a scientific treatise and that is what uh, we have to learn to accept that it is much more than a i mean it is it is not intended for it to be a scientific treatise let's go uh, let's talk a little bit more on the how and the why uh, or the how and the why versus the uh, sorry how versus the why and the who Uh, a canadian writer james houston um says the following uh it is not a primitive account He's talking about the genesis uh, account of creation it is not a primitive account of how the universe began but about who brought all things into being once again the emphasis is on the who not the how uh, so that's why we keep on saying don't look at it as a science science textbook um uh, we do not know how god did all of this you know the creation any more than we know how jesus turned water into wine can you give a scientific explanation of that <laughs> uh we could you know if you uh, analyze the molecules and all of those things but uh jesus does not take the time to explain that he just did it right lazarus coming from the dead now how did that take place uh did jesus uh you know uh revive his heart by a massage or uh, you know by an electrical impulse how did he do that well that's not the purpose for what what it was written it was written for the purpose of showing who jesus was and that he was you know the author of life and so just as water turning into wine just as lazarus coming out of the grave uh so the creation account is to show who is it behind the creation who created it and what was his grand design what was his grand purpose right so the exact mechanism is not revealed nor is it necessary for it to be revealed because we don't necessarily need to know that just like somebody said you don't need to know how an aeroplane flies to be able to take a plane and go to a place you know uh, you don't need to know that all you have to do is sit in the plane and you know uh, reach wherever you need to reach okay god needs no mechanism to accomplish anything i mean uh, in other words he can bring things into existence through his will or by just a word and but how does that how does that uh, translate how does that word translate into the actual creation well uh, it's beyond i mean to say beyond our understanding in, in, in that sense but science can explain something of it science still cannot explain so many things right so let us understand the purpose of science the si the purpose of science is the task of science is to discover what is uh but god's 
you know, it is to discover what God has already created. Right? So the task of scripture, on the other hand, is to tell us about the truths that lie beyond the reach of scientific experimentation. So the book of the, the, the Bible should be read so that we can understand what is beyond science. So we don't have to get stuck at science when you read the book of, you know, when, when you read the, the Bible. Let me give you another quote from Harold, uh, Harold Steigers. Uh, he is a theologian and he says, the Bible story of creation is not cosmo cosmogony, he says, or cosmology. Conclusions founded on such a characterization cannot stand. So the Bible is not a book on cosmology or cosmo cosmogony. Right? Cosmology tries to find a naturalistic explanation for the origin of the universe. But the Bible reveals it is a supernatural explanation. The Bible gives us a supernatural explanation of the creation of the universe. Okay. okay, two more thoughts and then I'm going to stop. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, I'm sure some of you might remember that name, uh, wrote some very interesting books. He says the point of the creation account in the book of Genesis is spiritual. He says the following, the universe had a personal beginning. Before in the beginning, that is how it starts the, the book of uh, Genesis. Before in the beginning, the personal was already there. And what does he mean by saying personal? Love and thought and communication existed prior to the creation of the heavens and the earth. So uh, interesting thought. He says that the, uh, the writing of the, or the account in the book of Genesis regarding the creation has a spiritual component to it, right? It shows there is a, a personal perspective to the creation. And we know from our understanding that that is God. God is a personal God, right? Of course, he is, as we would say, three persons in one being and one being. One more thought as I end here. Uh, another thought that for us to keep in mind is Genesis, the account of the creation in Genesis is also a call to worship. Why do I say that? Because the way it is written, it was designed to produce a deeply emotional reaction to the who of the, of the creation, right? Um, it is to react in thanksgiving. Because God created us in his image and he gave us the entire earth for us to rule, right? So it is also a call to worship. So right there, worship comes right there in the very first chapter of the Bible. And the reason for worship is because we ought to be thankful to a great God who decided out of his abund abounding love, overflowing love, to extend his love even outside of himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He decided to create, to let his love flow. That's why we say love is outgoing. It is other-centered. Uh, you know, even though God was perfect within himself, Yet he decided that he would uh, go beyond that to bring uh, his love to the created order. And of course, human beings are the primary object of his love. So when you read the Bible and then you read the creation account um, and uh, people start talking about, oh, but this is not scientific or that is not scientific, immediately keep in mind it was never meant to give you a scientific explanation. So don't fall into that trap. Okay. Next time, I'm going to talk about the, the controversy about the young earth or the old earth controversy. Some of you may have heard that there are some who believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old. 
while there are others who believe that the earth could actually be billions of years old, right? So what is the truth? Uh, scientists say it's billions. Some theologians even today say it's only 6,000 years old. So uh, we will look at that controversy next time. I'm going to now open it up for any questions, thoughts, and certainly your comments. I'm sure you might have some, uh, some you know, insightful uh, thoughts on this to, to uh, contribute. So please feel free to do so. Yes, Surimurti, do unmute yourself as you speak. The creation week, as described in Genesis 1, is absolutely scientific. Okay. It's absolutely scientific. Um, and uh, why I say there is one. Uh, website called Answers in Genesis. Hmm. I've been reading it for more than 10 years. Okay. And that group are, is, um, has a lot of people who are absolutely many PhDs there. Okay. So, so I would suggest you just type in the Google Answers in Genesis okay. or in the YouTube Answers in Genesis. All the arguments in favor of that will come out. Okay. Uh, Sudhimurthy, when you say that the creation week is scientific, are you saying that, uh, uh, are you talking about the literal 24-hour day creation? Yes, yes, yes. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. Okay, <laughs> yeah, well, there is a, once again, there are many views on that. And uh, I don't know if we can really nail down what is the actual view. Because if you look at the, uh, the, the uh, Genesis 1 itself, the reference to day could have many meanings. You know, uh, for example, uh, when you say, I think, uh, uh, in Genesis itself, there is a reference. I can't get the actual uh, uh, chapter and verse. It says, in the day God created. What does that mean? The word day is a reference to the entire creation. In the day that God created. So morning, morning and evening. See, that is, that is where the problem is. Uh, is it morning and evening? Or is it reference to the, uh, the, the what do you say, the event of creation? which is inclusive. Anyway, so the, the word so day there on basing on the context can mean, you know, slightly differently in the way it is used in Genesis one on the first day, the second day, the third day, you know, that's where uh, there are several views and maybe we'll uh, look into that a little bit more deeply uh, as we go on. Anyway, I would suggest to all of our members, all of us to, <laughs> Look into what they say in their answers and genesis. Okay. All right. Certainly, yes. Uh, let me just see. There was a, a Pauline uh, put a, a, a chat in the chat box. We do have BC and AD. How would that be detailed? Uh, she's asking. Pauline, can you just explain what you mean? Are you talking about uh, before Christ and uh, uh, AD, any, any domino, which is after Christ? What was the question, Pauline? Can you explain? I don't know if Pauline can hear us. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, we'll, we'll come to her uh, when she's able to catch up with us. Any other thoughts, questions? <laughs> Somebody's plates are falling. <laughs> Vanessa, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you're on mute, Vanessa. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, we can't hear you. Okay. 
the generation before us, our forefathers, they did not question the Bible so much. They just had faith, they read and they believed. Now, our generation, we have got internet. So we, we have started going into internet to find answers and we started questioning. If in our generation we are doing this, then in the coming generation, which hardly reads any books, so yeah. uh, they are mostly going into internet and in internet, uh, most of the stories are made up, most of the stories are uh, fabricated, most of the stories are not true or real. So don't you think that the coming generation and the generation after that is going to have more trouble with the Bible, believing the Bible, having faith than what our generation is having? <laughs> Uh, yes, I, I guess uh, a short answer to that question is uh, each generation will have its unique problems. And obviously with the uh, plethora of information available at the click of a button, uh, obviously people are going to question. I think uh, the way I would like to look at it is, um, uh, you know, we should not be afraid of inquiry. We should not be afraid of, of uh, trying to you know, have more knowledge, get more knowledge, uh, research, uh, grow in a greater understanding. Uh, I think that is uh, a blessing from God. God gave us a mind that is curious, wanting to know. He gave us a mind to be able to explore. And he's, he himself said, look up into the heavens and see the grandeur of, you know, of, of the creation. So, but like you rightly said, yes, some of the information disseminated is obviously a problem. Uh, we call it fake news. We call it, you know, fabricated, like you said. Uh, that's where we need discernment. And we have to be careful that we don't swallow everything without proper checking. We need to check what we are reading, what we are trying to uh, see. Uh, is, it, is it factual? It can be written in a way that it seems factual, but it, sometimes it isn't. It can be a deception. But yes, you're right that more and more people will question. And young people especially will question uh, because they have access to information that we never had. But we shouldn't be afraid of that. And the Bible, I'm sure, will give us the right answers if we honestly look at it. Does that help, Vanessa? I'm not sure if I veered away from your question. <laughs> right. Anybody else would like to add to that? Sikinder, please go ahead. Sir, we believe that the Bible itself is a creation, that itself is created by God. God created and he is having universal control on everything, cosmos, earth, whatever it is. Out of that, these people, that is scientists, laboratory, uh, what is the uh, like implements, whatever we call it, the medicines, they came out of this. Whatever difficulties, whatever obstructions we face, we need to know the answer through the creation, not with the scientific nature, but we ask God, God created and it was done. This is great, greater than scientific uh, scientists and scientific experiments are greater than greater than God, and it is universal understanding. Cosmos we have seen in the plain truth and all the magazine in, in the previous in the 60s, 70s. We, if we see, it is a great thing. It is there we can see. But uh, if the scientists question, uh, where is the beginning? We cannot tell. God only knows that because. He is the person who is control, who is, who is having control on everything, human nature or creation or natural resources, everything, the problems we face. We only know and uh, ask God to, to solve our problems and show the way and we enjoy the creation also. In our limited lifetime, we face many things. Okay. Even ecstasy, joy, sadness, 
for all this god god is having answers we are satisfied with that that's why the questioning of uh, when it began doesn't seem to be uh, in order that is uh, that doesn't have any uh, base okay i hope i do. right okay thank you sikandar i think you uh, basically are saying that god is the ultimate repository of all knowledge he is all knowing uh, omniscient uh, so the obviously the scientists uh, have a long way to catch up <laughs> but i hope you are not saying that it is wrong to have scientific inquiry uh, is it wrong to to have you know uh, uh to indulge in scientific experimentation so that we may know the workings of the universe Th those are i mean god allowed us or gave gave us the faculties to do that so that that is not wrong right it, it is yes it is yeah. definitely we have to go through that scientific nature and we we must know that but yeah. the result for that scientific experiments god will give the positive or negative if it is a negative one they are not uh, having that much wisdom as god is having okay god is the great scientific person <laughs> okay he is the greatest scientist <laughs> okay or bertie yes go ahead are you on mute bertie can you unmute yourself yeah uh, i would like to second what uh, mr sikandar parikshit mentioned uh, that he is the repository of all knowledge all wisdom of all science and that he is able to uh, even deal with what vanessa brought up you know <laughs> uh, in the future generation where there are fabricated things or they depend upon the internet rather than on the books uh, which you know by whereby these things are recorded and uh, internet would probably uh, could be a distorted picture or whatever Yeah. Uh, as uh, uh, Sikandar mentioned, it is God who can deal with it. In fact, in the proverb is written that the um, the lot is thrown in proverb book of the lot is thrown into the lap, but its disposal is from the Lord. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you know there are there are many plans in man's heart. <laughs> uh, again, proverb mentioned, but it is the Lord's purpose that will stand. and uh, another place says he, he makes the wisdom of the world you know look foolishness so we have to be a little careful that we remember god who has made us uh, made you and me made others with such great wisdom and power uh, that we need to love him and serve him respect him and receive the understanding given by him okay yes certainly yes thanks buddy Okay. Uh, um, yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir, uh, sir, can you please explain what is the gap theory? Gap theory. <laughs> Between f first one talks of creation from verse two onwards, are we launching into recreation? Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, once again, that's a, a highly scientific, and I may not do a good job in explaining. But uh, with what I understand is. uh verse 1 genesis 1 verse 1 says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth verse 2 says in the earth became uh void and formless tohu and bohu i think in the hebrew <laughs> i remember that from mr armstrong days uh uh so the question is how was this earth suddenly rendered uh you know uh, void and formless and that is the gap between the creation and the earth becoming like this or the universe i don't know uh, you know uh, they say that uh, in between the rebellion of satan or rather lucifer took place and there was a mass destruct destruction that took place which also affected the earth and that's how the earth became form and without form and void right and formless so the gap is between the creation and the earth becoming a uh, void and then verse 3 onwards it talks about a recreation some people like to call it a recreation 
God said, let there be light. Uh, so that is how it is explained. If I'm sure some of someone else can some throw some more light on that. Anybody else would like to bring in some thoughts there? Gap theory. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Uh, you're on mute, Bertie. Yes, uh, you see, God created uh, the heavens and the earth and sea, as the Bible mentioned in the beginning. It's in timelessness. Okay, we uh, don't know much about it time, but then uh, the gap is there that uh, Tohu and Bohu, because of what what maybe because of Satan's rebellion, whatever. Then this re uh, recreation that we say this day and night making it habitable for man and God uh, in his creativity made it, you know, for, to fulfill his purpose for man and mm. to make us in his own image like us and which he'll fulfill is the time time period. It's in time frame. It's the yeah. time frame. And again, it will go into timelessness. When eternity, we talk about eternal life. We talk about, you know, living, uh, you know, in eternity. You see, God yeah. brings us into eternal life and the way is Jesus Christ. You know, that... Uh, so yeah. it is timelessness, then the time frame, and then again timelessness. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. There is uh, one thought that you brought out. I think is something that we can all keep in mind. There is so much that we don't understand. There is so much we are unable to comprehend uh, in in this in this uh, in all of these topics and subjects. Uh, well, I guess, like you said, in eternity we will have a lot of time. <laughs> or in timelessness, we'll have a lot of time to, uh, you know, discuss all of these matters. Yeah. Does it help, Franklin? Or you have any thoughts yes, further? Sir. So technically, is it correct, sir? Um, are you saying uh, is this uh, is creation this and recreation? Can we use the word recreation? Uh, well, <laughs> once again, there are question marks. You know. Uh, we may feel, you know, this could be how it is explained, but I don't think we have a definitive answer for that. That is what is, you know, we, we keep ourselves open because we don't know if, uh, if there is some more information uh, or I, that I should say there is not enough information to make a definitive, you know, conclusion. Uh, we could speculate and say it could be this, it could be that. I, that, that is how we would like to leave it. That's at least from a GCI perspective. <laughs> Anil, yes, Rekha, go ahead. God says my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. And everything was pointing towards uh, the timeless, that is Jesus coming to the earth at uh, that time. So this timelessness was, is we don't, we'll never understand, but we can understand Jesus coming into time and that's how and finally back again to eternity so that there's a long timeline which you have to understand yeah, oh yes i mean yeah when you bring in the whole incarnation thing uh and uh oh that that is mind-blowing really i mean uh, god entering time <laughs> it's amazing anil you had a thought yeah yeah no i was just uh to uh franklin poppins question about uh Gap, gap theory. There's right. also something called God of the Gaps, uh -huh. which you know the theologians had propagated this to outline that if what science cannot explain, it means there's a gap in the scientific knowledge, is the proof of the existence of God. So God of the Gaps. That's what it was um, listed as. That you know, uh, you, science can't explain everything, and there are gaps, and that's where God fits in. So right. I. I I mean, another perspective of the gap theory of God or the gaps. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, there, are, there are people who use the, the God of the gaps theory to explain the presence of or the existence of God, which I think is a kind of a weak argument. Uh, mm -hmm. And one person who, who really uh, tackles this is a fellow called uh, John Lennox. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, oh, he is a brilliant. Uh, he's just amazing with his analysis. And he's got a uh, book written lectures on uh, Genesis 1 and 2. He talks about the days and maybe Surya Murthy would like to have a look at that. Uh, 
uh, he talks about the seven days that uh, divided the world or something like that. Uh, yeah, he's, he is very good. Uh, so God of the Gaps thing is once again, not a very, uh, what do you say? Uh, we, we don't necessarily just believe in a God of the Gaps. God, he's God of everything, not just the gap. <laughs> There's another person by the name of Ross. I forget his first name. He has also written a, a number of books on explaining how science explained, uh, I mean, what, what the Bible is totally scientific and so on and so forth, as, as Surya Murthy was saying. Okay. He's a pastor and he has written this, uh, I remember his last name, I forget the first name, it, it's uh, Ross. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I remember that name, yes. Right. Well, any more controversies from Genesis 1, <laughs> creation account? Or at least uh, what we are discussing really is, uh, is science, is the Bible against science and vice versa? Is science against the Bible? You know, uh, can you, do you have to discard science if you believe in the Bible? Uh, or do you have to discard the Bible if you believe in science? And I think that is the, uh, the question that we want to leave you with. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir. God created the heaven in the beginning. God created the God created the creation. That means, sir, the Big Bang theory by uh, by virtue of this statement being true, all other statements are false. The Big Bang theory is a false theory. <laughs> well, uh, there you are going into the uh, origins of the universe. Uh, it's we know that God created, but how do you know it is not a Big Bang that God used to create? God used the Big Bang to create the universe. Yeah. Now, what is in question is what was before the Big Bang? How? Uh, I mean, they say there was uh, there was this infinitesimally small, as they call singularity. How did uh, where did that come into being? That's where, you know, the answer God answers it that that's how I created it. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean. Uh, uh, once again, that is bringing the evolutionary perspective. The, the, the whole theory of evolution is to show that you can explain the origin of the universe naturalistically. Uh, you don't need a God for it. I think, uh, who is that scientist who died recently? He said, you don't need a God for the creation. Okay. Uh, Hawkins, yes. Right. And, uh, and then there was this experiment to find out what was the, what is the, uh, as the essential element from which everything came, Higgs boson or something like that. They were, remember, there was some experimentation. They're God trying particle. the God particle. Yes, they're trying to find the most fundamental particle out of which everything came to be. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing uh, and the kind of explorations that are going on. Which okay, the scientific inquiry, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I didn't realize that uh, I thought this is going to be a boring subject, but I'm glad that uh, <laughs> there has been some animated discussion. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so next week, we will study, uh, you know, the young earth theory or the old earth theory, uh, which is true. Uh, then there is a controversy on that. We'll see how far we can go with that. So in, in case you have any, any material that you can present during our discussion, feel free to do so. Right. But uh, I think we're just about uh, out of time. Thank you very much all for joining us. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving this lovely opportunity to know and learn your word intimately. It is very opportunate for all of us who have um, the, um, the taken the time to attend this just to gain the knowledge of you, Father. Despite uh, whatever the uh, the topics could be science or thing. We are your faithful Jesus, and that's why we are gathered here to know you more intimately. And let this time which we spend together not go futile, but be it fruit, uh, fruitful, Father. And we also pray today for all the um, uh, members of our church who have not attended, but who are there in spirit and uh, uh, and they will be having the time and energy and the inclination to go through uh, what they missed today, Father. Today, as we conclude this uh, Bible study, 
um, uh, sure, Father, you, you have uh, given us the thought to think further deep on this and come to a very good solution, which is again in your will, Father, whether the uh, pendulum is tinting towards God, you the Father, or towards science. You have given us the knowledge. So we place all this at your will, Father. And uh, as we conclude the prayers today, Father, and we retire to our bed, we request you to protect us and give us a peaceful life and uh, send, send your angels to uh, give us good health, peace, and rest until we rise again and see the bright, uh, bright side of the day and be willing to praise and worship and pray you, Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you all for joining and uh, God bless you all. Please have a enjoy a rest of your day. <laughs>